second annual showcase. We're very lucky to be in this beautiful space tonight, thanks to Philly Cam. I'm Yoe Shaw, the director and lead educator of Philly Youth Radio. And I'm Beth Patel, I'm the coordinator and workshop facilitator. And we're gonna be your hosts for the evening. So we're so happy that all of you have joined us here tonight. And we're even happier to share all of our hard work with you. Back in January, we asked our students, what does a sanctuary mean to you? And we heard a lot of answers. Uh, a place that you go to be alone and get away from everything. Uh, somewhere that you work hard to make safe for others. Even just a place you can always go back to to feel like you're home again. We also discussed the things that can threaten a sanctuary, from bulldozers to growing up. And then the hardest question, can you draw your sanctuary? <laughs> and that's when we realized some of our students were, made to make radio, were meant to make radio and not art. Including Yeah, the so, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> like last year, we started off with the basics of radio storytelling, so how to pitch a story, you know, how to conduct an interview, and how to write a script. And for the first time in Philly Youth Radio history, we lent out recording equipment, and everything came back in one piece, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and along back with it came the sounds of the people, things, and even animals that make each sanctuary unique. We then introduced the very boring process of logging tape, which very I'm boring. sure you all enjoyed. And then script writing began, which meant a lot of writing, editing, and rewriting. So, you know, at least these, these scripts went through at least four full edits. The first one, of course, being a complete scrapping of the first draft they brought back for homework. <laughs> so, but before we share our final stories with you, we're going to present our first ever Philly Youth Radio video produced by Aiden Un. Aiden clearly didn't know what he was getting himself into when he signed up to work with us, but we're relieved that he stuck by us and that our students didn't <laughs> mind being followed around by a cameraman. Yeah, or at least, as most of them pointed out, at least he's a very good looking cameraman. <laughs> Don't blush, so. Aiden. Without further ado, let's check it out. My name is Shayla. My story is about going away to college and leaving my grandparents behind. I'd be sad. I wonder how they'll deal. <laughs> Come on, Pop, be a little serious about life. My name is Nassim, and my story is about the place where I volunteer and worry whether it will be the same when I'm gone. Now we have to read for at least 20 minutes. Hi. My name is Tian. My story is about being a big sister and needing my own space. Because I'm scared. Uh, what are you afraid of? Ghosts. My name is Kavana, and my story is about the park I like to go to to be alone and how my parents will make it safe. Okay, thank you. Mom. Well, all right, good night. Since March of 2011, Philly Youth Radio has been working with young people in Philadelphia to produce audio stories about what matters to them. Our youth radio apprentices attend weekly radio production workshops where they learn how to pitch stories, record interviews, write a script, and track in a studio. Throughout the program, students learn how to express their ideas more clearly in speech and in writing, skills that will be useful long after students complete their apprenticeship. We hope that these youth-produced radio stories will promote intercultural and intergenerational dialogue and help to build understanding about young people's lives and their contributions. More importantly, we hope that the intensive collaboration between adults and young people fosters meaningful relationships and creates experiences that we all learn from. We're handing young people the mic, and we need your help to do that. Support Philly Youth Radio. <laughs> Thanks again to Aiden for making that video. What'd you guys think? It was good, right? Yeah. So we'll see how good it is once it makes us money on Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to our stories. 
This time we were really fortunate to have photographers come and visit each student's sanctuary. So we need to give a big thank you to WHYY, Brad Larison, Kimberly Painter, and Boss Sl Slobbers for being photographers. <laughs> thank you. All right, let's get started. Uh, since Nassim was almost always first to arrive at workshop, <laughs> we're going to continue that trend tonight and share his story first. Besides Philly Youth Radio, Nassim Smith spent a lot of time at this after school program in North Central Philadelphia. Let's listen in. The sound you're hearing is what I hear every day. There's music, basketball, cars, trucks, subway, and yelling. West Susquehanna is where I live, and this is Treehouse Books, one of the only bookstores in North Central Philadelphia. It's quiet inside. One of the quietest places I come in contact with. I've been volunteering at Treehouse for three years, and it's my sanctuary. Come on inside. I've always felt that all winter. That's a nine-year-old girl who's been coming after school for a year and a half. She's reading her favorite book. She's one of 20 to 25 kids who've come to Treehouse to read after school. Their friends are here, they like the adults, and it's a safe place from the world outside. I think the kids definitely have to face drugs and violence. Celine Haber goes to Temple University, and she's been tutoring children here for two years. She'll tell you it's not always nice outside. Especially since the guys next door smoke weed, like it's their job in the summer. Sometimes I feel that my job inside of Treehouse is to help them leave their problems at the door, just like they're taking their jackets off. I talk to them about school, their homes, family, and friends. I've even helped a kid who's gotten bullied. But sometimes violence comes in anyway, as Celine can tell you. Sometimes violence can be a problem inside Treehouse because kids do get into fights, and I mean, I have had a chair thrown at me. Still, the kids continue to come. I've seen kids not being able to read at all, and then a year or two later, they're reading chapter books. They come here, I come here, day after day, year round. It's always open if, you, if anyone ever needs it. I know that I have a lot of the kids' numbers and they have my number, and if they ever need me, you call, like, you call me. I'm always there, I'm always available. Temple student Max Williams has also been tutoring for a couple of years. He's also found a sanctuary at Treehouse. And like, I know I've certainly come here on terrible days. Yeah, I was actually here when my grandma died. I found out my yeah. grandma died when I was here. I, I came here when my aunt died. Dedication is important to Treehouse, but most volunteers move on eventually. Some more quickly than others, says Celine. Tutors come once or twice and then never show up again. I've been showing up at Treehouse for three years, and I don't want to be part of the problem by not showing up. But college is around the corner for me. So what happens when Celine, Max, and I have to leave? As long as a kid in my neighborhood has to travel through violence to get to safety, I want to be there. Even though I've got to make my exit to college soon, I'll be back. <laughs> Great job, Miss Good job, Miss It was wonderful. <laughs> All right, our next story is brought to you by Teen To, who is a returning Philly Youth Radio student and a senior at South Philadelphia High. She's going to go to college next year, and right now she's struggling to hold on to her sanctuary. I love you, sister. You're number one. That's what my little sister says to me when she wants my debit card. But I don't just give her and my little brother money for toys, clothes, and books. I share my bedroom with them. We put green mattresses together to make a big bed. Every morning, I wake them up, bring them water, and pick out their clothes. When an annoying telemarketer calls, they hand the phone to me. When the toilet gets stuck, they call me to plunk it. Believe it or not, my sister is 17 and my brother is 12. But I can't stop taking care of them. It's my natural instinct as a 20 years old big sister. That's why I need this room. This is my sanctuary. I don't have to be a big sister here. In this tiny room, I get to paint, 
write in my journal, read books, and browse the internet for my dream wedding dress. And all without my annoying brother and sister. This wasn't always my sanctuary. My aunt used to live here. She moved out to live with her boyfriend. And then my brother took over the room. He moved his laptop, piggy bank, and bakuga balls, toys, from the living room upstairs. But one day, he watched a scary video in the room and then left. It was a video of a spiral. I watched it. It's bar- it spiral in and in and in. I got like hypnotized. You can't be alone in a room now, and I'm happy because it's mine. But I'm not sure if I can keep it for long. I clean up my room because I want to practice myself. Oh no. My brother is trying to get over his fear and wants to move his stuff back into the room. He probably wants a sanctuary too. My aunt might also be coming home. Even today, my parents use it as a warehouse. In this room, they put their clothes, mattresses, old electronics, and every month, my mom moves my paintbrushes, stuffed animals, and paper out to the basement. My family doesn't realize that I need this display to put myself together. I go crazy if I keep on sleeping in the same bed as my brother and sister. But I know I'm part of the problem. I think I spoil them. Soon, I'll be going to college. Hopefully, I'll find a new sanctuary. And I'll have to focus more on managing my own problems for a change. My siblings, they need to grow up. I'll just have to be a different kind of big sister. I will surely visit and encourage them, and I'll probably still give them my money. But next time they ask me to fix the toilet, I'll just call the plumber. Good job, team. Thanks. The next story is by Kavana Batiam, who is a 17-year-old junior at Friend Select School. She leads a stressful, hectic life, but has developed some useful strategies to deal. Hi, you reached Kavana. Even though I'm not here, I don't want to talk to you right now, so leave a message or whatever, and I will call you back, maybe. Bye. That was my voicemail. Everyone gets it at least once when they call me. Don't take it personally. Sometimes I just need time alone to disconnect and relax. That's when I forward my calls to voicemail and I go to Clark Park. This will probably seem weird to kids my age who like to go to parties, but on a Friday night, I'd rather be sitting alone at the local park. When I was a freshman, my parents let me take Septa by myself and I started getting off at the park on my way home from school. The rainy and cold days are best because the park is empty and no little kids will be hogging the swings, and I can get on them and listen to my music. There's no schoolwork, there's no drama, it helps me calm down, and I can just concentrate on swinging. It's an escape from having to worry about homework, softball, and applying to college. With two parents, a little brother, four little sisters, a cat, and a dog, silence is hard to come by in my house. I don't have my own room. There really is no place inside our little house where I can be alone. And it's always noisy there. No, you're weak. Help me, sister. <laughs> Those are my little sisters. They crack me up, but sometimes I need a break. So I interrupted my mom during her break watching her favorite show, Democracy Now!, to see if she had the same problem growing up. Yes, the sanctuary I loved to go to was, it was a space in between, um, in our kitchen, where our refrigerator was against the wall. My mother had a space in between there, and I was able to go in there and sit in there quietly. So you could get away from Uncle Rodney and Uncle Rodney from there? Yes, I could. That's something we have in common, then. I guess anyone who has siblings needs her own place to be alone for the sake of sanity. But my mom doesn't like me going to the park. She doesn't think it's safe. Well, my main concerns are people who are 
at the park with ulterior motives to take people and girls as it starts to get dark. Uh, there are a lot of bushes and things that a person can be pulled behind. I asked some people at the park what they thought. Yeah, like the, the only thing is like the dogs over there, like they play there and they come over and this, sometimes I'm a little bit afraid of that because of the kids. Doesn't sound like a scary park to me. Still, I guess I could see why my parents would be concerned. But I don't want to give up my alone time at the park. I really like it here and I feel safe and happy. So I'm willing to make this my one act of teenage rebellion. I'll just make sure to do a better job of answering my phone when swinging. Thank, Thank you, you Savannah. <laughs> that was awesome. All right, our final story is brought to you by Shayla Torres, another returning Philly Youth Radio student, and she's a senior at Community Academy. She's going away to college next year, but that means she's going to have to leave her grandparents behind. My grandma, or mommy as I call her, always tells me, No es que hace, sino el que cría. It means the mother doesn't necessarily have to be the person who birthed you, but could be the one who raised you. That's how I also feel about my grandpa, or papi as I call him. He always wears a gold charm containing his name and my gold heart ring. Together, they are the two people who have raised me in this cruel world. They've removed me from a bad environment, aka my irresponsible teenage parents. We share an unbreakable bond. The love I feel when I walk through the doors is my sanctuary. There goes Tiny barking as usual. Looking around, I see the same home I grew up in for the last 18 years. I leave in a couple of months for college all the way up in Northwest Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna miss everything. Playing dominoes, bingo, and we with the family. Ready, ready, ready. I'm going to miss my mommy's home-cooked meals, like arroz con habichuela and sopa de camarones. How am I ever going to leave here? It sucks, because a part of me wants Philadelphia to just fade in my rear window. I want to walk away from those guys who sometimes mistake me for a prostitute when I walk home, and crazy people who scream at night on my block. I want to walk into the next chapter of my life. I want to see the look on those teachers' faces who told me I wouldn't amount to anything. On the flip side, I'm terrified. I remember when I moved to Puerto Rico for a year with my biological mom. It took a heavy toll on my papi. He got very depressed. His blood pressure skyrocketed, leaving him in the hospital. It ate me up inside, knowing he could have died. I worry that me leaving for college could take a toll on his health again. I guess you could say it's not the physical home that's my sanctuary, but the people that I love within it. My mommy and papi have always been my inspiration. I'm grateful for all that they have done for me. One night at the dinner table, I talked to my mommy about what my leaving would mean. Well, I feel proud in one way, and the other way, I feel sad, because you're leaving me. And what can we do to resolve this problem that we're having so that we can feel secure with me leaving. I guess you could call me like uh, maybe 10 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to take my poppy, but he kept playing around. So, Pop, how do you feel about me going away to college? I'd be happy. Why are you happy? Mm. I'd be happy because go you go. You have issues. Come on, be serious. Deep down, I think the topic is a sensitive one. He's sad, but he also pulled me aside and told me that he's proud and how he tells all his friends of what a great doctor I will be someday. I have this fantasy of stuffing them into my little pink suitcase and running off with them until my toes hit campus. It's okay. It's okay. Who wouldn't okay. want their grandma cooking for them while they're studying or having their grandpa by their side to ask for a couple bucks? I know I would. Unfortunately, I live in this world called reality. But instead, I'll take with me all the love, guidance, and support they've given me over the years. And the memories.
Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Great job, Shayla. That was wonderful. And thank you again to WHYY and Brad Larison, Boz Slobbers, and Kimberly Painter for those beautiful photographs. Uh, now we'd like to have a short panel discussion with our youth radio apprentices. Uh, <laughs> so let's get started. Yep. All right, Nassim, we're going to start with you again. So obviously, Treehouse means a lot to you. You've been volunteering there for three years. So how did you manage to produce an audio story about Treehouse without making a commercial for it? Um, well, I think when you work so close and intimate with a program, especially for as long as I have, which has been three years, you learn to, I don't know, be, it's really personal. And that's what I brought out in my story, um, what I really felt. And I really feel strongly about Treehouse because I love the guys there. I feel like it's an amazing program and they do a lot for the youth uh, of tomorrow. So thank you. Cool, excellent response. Uh, Teen, you're up next. So you're ge gearing up to go to college soon. Have you started trying to be a big, a different kind of big sister yet? And how have your siblings reacted? Uh, yes, I did. I try to ask them to be more independent with what they do and um, sometimes they take it seriously, sometimes they like, oh whatever, you're playing, <laughs> you're kidding me. But I think they, knew, they do realize that I will be absent soon, so I hope they have some posit positive tension in their like, attitude and <laughs> lifestyle. Cool. Thank you, team. Thanks. All right, Kavana, so, hey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what similarities do you see between your sanctuary and the one your mom had when she was your age that she mentions in the story? I think we both just used our sanctuaries to get away from our siblings. And she had two brothers and I have, well, five, I live with five siblings. And you know how when you're like a kid or like a teenager, you're always complaining about stuff that isn't really that bad. Like I love my family, <laughs> but then you get a murder. So yeah, we like, you wouldn't think of the park or like the space between a refrigerator or your wall as like a sanctuary. But you know, we found, I guess, a place, a small place just to be by ourselves. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Finally, Shayla, uh, you mentioned in your story um, how there are these stereotypes that teachers and others had for you growing up. Uh, what did you mean by having to break through those stereotypes and how were you able to do that? Well, growing up, I've always attended public schools because, I mean, who has money for Catholic school anymore, especially with this economy? <laughs> and there, there were a lot of Hispanics, the ones that I went to, and I guess the teachers, instead of finding the individuals, they labeled all of us. And they're like, well, since this girl's pregnant, I'm pretty sure you're going to come out like that, or this kid is smoking weed, so, I mean, you have no hope for yourself. So I broke past that, and I became my own individual and I started like breaking apart from everyone so they can see me as myself. That's what I did. <laughs> I'm Thanks. unique. Awesome. All right, now we wanted to open up some questions for all of you. And the first question we have is what was the most difficult part about um, reporting and conducting interviews for your pieces? Okay. So you guys see my dog, right? <laughs> She's cute. But all she does is yap, 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 yap. <laughs> so I'm recording people. I'm like, tiny, be quiet. Go over there. <laughs> but of course, she just looks at me and just goes, bark. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're, you're very nice. So it was really hard to get those ambient sounds, aka my dog, away from everything while I was recording. But yeah, so you just have to work with what you have. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of interviews like, with people I didn't know like at the park. I tried to get like strangers, just like, what did they think about the park? And <laughs> like, it's not my strongest point, like talking to people and like stuff like that. So it was hard. It was like, I got nervous, but you know, they were cool and I ended up like, getting good footage, so it was fine. Mm, the toughest part, um, also the most awkward part of reporting <laughs> is talking to my brother and sister in English because basically I just talk to them in Vietnamese or Chinese. And when it comes to English, I will lie, uh, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> and so I take a lot of time to convince them that this is important and finally they agree to do it. That's good. <laughs> um, the toughest part for me would um, have to be to not make it a commercial.
because Treehouse is very um, important to me, and I definitely want to advertise it as much as possible. But <laughs> in radio, that's something you're not supposed to do. Uh, myself, <laughs> Yoe, and Bruce, we definitely sat down and talked about this a lot, and that's what we wanted not to happen. But I felt like uh, I did an amazing job at it. So. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. And you're so confident. <laughs> One more question uh, for the panel. Uh, so how has Philly Youth Radio um, affected the way that you consume media, the way that you read the news or watch TV? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm a teenager. We hate the news. We want to watch MTV. But, you know, you can't hide the remote from my grandpa for long before he finds it underneath the sofa. So, you know, you kind of just have to sit there and give him his time and just lay back and watch it. So as you watch 6ABC News, I realize a lot that there's more to a story than re what really meets the eye. And I feel as though the media, they like they overlook a lot of things and they like to tend to pull out the bad in things. You don't really see stories like ours. You don't see success stories and that's the thing that gets me. Like, you, they dramatize things and you see the bad side to everything. So I wish that you could always see like more of the youth portrayed better than what they are. Like, they do a flash mob downtown, you see that, but you don't see a kid with a scholarship to a, like a prestigious college. So that's the only thing I would say about how I view the media differently. I see the bad side to it, and I wish I could see the good side to it. That's a really good answer, Shayla. Um, Anybody so else have a quick response? Yeah, quick response. <laughs> yeah, just see how much work it takes into put it, to make in a story, and how many people it takes, you know, to put everything together. And it's harder work than you think it is when you see a like a report or anything. Cool. All right. So I take all right, great. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And can you guys stand up? Yeah. Yeah, stand, stand up, up and thank be you applauded by yeah. the audience. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, that's good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you again to, for giving us that behind the scenes look at your stories and process. Um, we're going to uh, just end with the Philly Youth Radio tradition. What do you think that is, guys? Shout out. <laughs> All right. So uh, shout outs. Yeah. We're going to start with our first shout out. Yeah. So shout outs are my favorite part of the workshop. And our first shout outs are going to go to the Leeway Foundation, Asian Arts Initiative, and WHYY, because without them, this project would not have been possible. The next round of shout outs goes to Bruce Schimmel, uh, Jeanette Woods, Erin Mishkin for making this possible. and. Uh, now, if everyone can come up to the stage, that, that has, has helped, helped make Philly Youth Radio possible. So we're going to quickly read off the names. And if you could come yeah. up, one we read. So, right. Victoria Chow. Yeah. Uh, um, Henry Cohn Geltner. Rob Hedges Gadel. Uh, Emma Jacobs. Brad Larison. Pat Ma. Kimberly Painter. Um, Elizabeth Bettis Luna. Craig Santoro. Nicole Siemens. Boz Slobbers. Uh, Nasha Taylor. Aiden Un. Hey, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs>